Y-Gen? All of you, I guess. What generation are you then if you're not Y-Gen? <laughs> <laughs> hands up if you're Y-Gen. Okay, well, hands up if you're so you think you're something else. <laughs> okay, well, the main thing is that in five to seven to ten years' time, you will be in charge of everything. So, uh, get ready. Let's start the journey. And to do that, I'm going to head back a couple of centuries uh, to talk about work a bit. I want to set this in the context of the sweep of history about work. So in this slide, um, I'm just looking at a, a, a sort of a, just over a century in, in one visual. The industrialization of work is a relatively recent <coughs> occurrence, kicking off with the first industrial revolution, resulting initially with scenes like the one in the top left with sweatshops and people being exploited uh, uh, very, very, very bad. <coughs> Nothing changes, you might say. Uh, if you look at all the uh, controversies over t-shirts and uh, 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 track shoes and so on. Work got better under some of the Victorian era philanthropists. We have put the image of uh, Bournemouth there, people like Cadbury, the Roundtrees and the Lever Brothers, who built who built industrial towns for people where the conditions were good, where the sanitation worked, and so on and so forth. They recognized these Victorian philanthropists that if you treated people well, they were going to work well for you. If, if they were allowed to be happy and have self-respect, uh, they would participate more fully in the workplace. And of course, they were the unusual ones doing that. And it wasn't just here that that occurred. The US had their own socially-minded industrialists like the Vanderbilts, the famous Carnegie, the Rockefellers, and many, amongst many, many others. Though, of course, the line between Rob being a robber baron and philanthropist was and is still blurred. And in fact, the two are almost bedfellows in a way, unless you've made all that money, you can't be a philanthropist. So <laughs> you can't just be a philanthropist, uh, unless you're second generation and the, and the money disappears very quickly. So, in the first machine age, the likes of Taylor and others call for the standardization of production, removing all discretion from workers who did dull, repetitive tasks. And as Henry Ford said, you can have any color of car you like provided it's black. So that was the beginning uh, of the efficiency period of, of making lots of stuff cheaply uh, and creating, if you like, the first consumer revolution. That was the purpose of the Industrial Revolution, kicked off in this country and then spread around the world. And you had to have standardization to drive those costs down. Then you had the influence of the unions that influenced positively working conditions from around about the mid 1800s uh, or so. Post World War II witnessed the beginnings of globalization, well represented by the image of the shell building at the top there. Um, a monumental structure, and many monumental structures you pass through London with important people on the top. Um, and the rest of us somewhere down towards the bottom. And with, uh, with uh, fashions changing, compliance and IT used to be in the basement, and now compliance is in, on the top floor next to the CEO, especially in the financial industry, because unless you get your compliance right, you're going to prison, uh, as, as, we, as we will see. So those, those social orders uh, blur and change. In that, in that era, uh, post-World War II, we, and workers were happy to provide our loyalty for security and play the corporate game. Keep your nose clean, as the English expression goes. And there are other, there are other themes at work in the last century. The adaptation of marketing, uh, another industry in which uh, Britain led for a while the world. Uh, and what happened was that the techniques of marketing were applied internally. And where did marketing kind of spring from? Well, World War II saw the rise of propaganda on both sides, and in a sense, uh, the marketing industries and the internal communication industries were taking the roots of uh, political propaganda uh, for the purposes of selling stuff to people externally and for aligning people behind the big idea, the big pl plan internally. So the first wave of internal communication uh, was all about coercion, persuasion, uh, and getting people lined up behind somebody else's uh, idea. And of course, at that time, that was good because at least people felt that they had a place in making this big, big idea, this big idea work. But it's the adaptation of, of, of marketing. 
And I, in fact, founded <coughs> one of those early agencies in the 80s, and uh, we did well on that kind of stuff. We don't do any of that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, other themes were things like industrial democracy, <coughs> empowerment, and these things come and go or stay a bit. And then towards the end of the last century, uh, that loyalty for security contract which I mentioned was shattered uh, as the security was no longer being paid for the loyalty and thus people started to have multiple, multiple career experiences rather than having cradle to grave experiences. So the psychological contract um, really, really began to shatter towards the end of the last century. And then we had another massive social impact uh, on all of this and po possibly a coincidence, possibly a cause. Uh, the wall came down 25 years ago, just a couple of weeks. We saw that all those television pictures from, from Germany, the celebrations uh, of that. And we all witnessed velvet revolutions in the former <coughs> Soviet-occupied Eastern Europe. And the much more messy attempts by peoples of the Arab world trying to throw off authoritarian regimes. And yes, that is a complex challenge and we'll have to wait many decades to see how that how that pans out. But then if we look into corporate land, we're also seeing a challenge to authoritarian command and control hierarchical capitalism, which has been the, way, the main way of organizing work since World War II, and perhaps a little before. The employee engagement movement uh, rumbled into life at the turn of the century. But you might ask, which century? Well, I would say both, actually. As the last century progressed, Successive liberal thinkers challenged command and control, including McGregor with Y theory, Ucci with Z theory, Draca, uh, a very, very prolific writer, and many, many others. But they all seem to fail to knock down the wall of command and control management. Will E theory, employee engagement theory, go the same way? The answer is I don't know. <laughs> We're early days into it. It's fun. There's lots of wonderful experiments going on. Lots more dem democracy in some corporations, and some of those are performing exceptionally well. But the notion that intrigues me in putting these pictures up before you, the Arab Spring and, and uh, the Velvet Revolutions, is the adjacency of these uprising on national stages and the possible appearance of more mutual styles of leadership in corporate land. Maybe it's just a coincidence, and I'm looking for a, a relationship which doesn't exist. Okay, so much for setting the stage. Now let's explore what this concept of employee engagement is all about. Uh, there's lots of you here. I want you to turn to who you're sitting next to in a pair. So please do not be alone for this. You can't do it alone. So, <laughs> so to join somebody behind you or in front of you. So get yourself sorted out, be with somebody, whether you know them or not, doesn't matter. Here is the task. You're in a pair, and I want you to think about a project or a period, outside or inside work or in study, where you were immersed, 100% committed and inspired to make something a fabulous success. What was it that you did, and what did it feel like, and what were the factors and conditions that enabled you to really get stuck in, get engaged in, in the project or period that you, you reflect on? So talk in your pair and swap, and see if you can identify the point of ignition. A few minutes. Thank you very much, both of you. They were fabulous stories. Um, Okay, so in summary, I think what they both said in one way or another, people engage themselves, and that's an important phrase, people engage themselves. The organisation doesn't do it to us. It can't. This is an intrinsic process where I elect, I feel safe, I feel energetic about engaging myself in this work at activity. So all this stuff that corporates do, programmes, surveys, all this bullshit, you know, does any of it work? Big question. So people engage themselves when they have control or influence, when they work across boundaries. Miriam's working across boundaries. 
where they're trusted to get on with it, and when it is safe to speak up and challenge, and of all of those, safe to speak up and challenge is key. You don't get that in command and control. You get unsafe uh, and you get punishment. So, not surprisingly, the best ideas are never heard. Which workers would you say are the most engaged and productive? Ideas. Shout it out. Which workers are the most engaged and productive? Say it, say again. Teachers. Teachers. Who said that? Stick a, stick a paw up. You're both pointing at each other. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Lovely. Great idea. Thank you. So, artists. 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 Yeah, artists. Lovely. Thank you. Self employed. Self employed. Who said that? Mm. Oh, good man. Fantastic. Who else? Engineers. Engineers. Yeah. So, if you look back at the stories we've just been, those two stories. Um, it is people like this in the, uh, the, in the screenshot. The most engaged, the most engaged and the most productive are the self-employed business owners and in corporate land it is those with the widest discretion over their work and obviously teachers have a fabulous discretion uh, over, over what they, well, at least how they work and, and how they do it. At Manchester Airport Anybody been to Manchester Airport? This guy puts his hand up to everything, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I want you on the team. <laughs> A group of workers have similar engagement scores as the top management up there in the 70s and 80s. Why? Because this group have opted to join a scheme whereby they can apply for grants to improve operational efficiency and customer satisfaction normally for the preserve of management. So that, that group has, those workers have fantastic engagement schools, 70s, 80s. Those who don't are down there in the 30s in the doldrums. So what's the lesson of that? The lesson of that is that we need to involve people in the real work challenges. So they're participating in building the experience, in building the dream, not giving them kind of placebo engagement programs on the side and all that stuff. They have to be involved in real work. So much for the concept of, of engagement. But uh, academics like David Guest of Imperial and Rob Brina in Bath are sceptical, arguing that the concept is old wine in new bottles. And I do share some of that, uh, that scepticism. Well, that's a story for another day. So what, what other types of workers are most engaged? Those on a mission. What is, have a compelling purpose, and here you have Greenpeace, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, much in the news uh, lately, uh, of course. So those with a compelling mission or purpose, all they need is, is that shared purpose and, and, and the values word. And of course, commitment to an idea can range from curiosity, adherence, critical, sceptical belief, blind belief, obsession, Consumption, fanaticism, terrorism. So you want to stop a dial somewhere in the middle, otherwise you end up in ISIS. So, well, they've got a mission, <laughs> and they've got values. They not be very attractive, but there you are. What is another group of engaged per people? Here they are, kids. What do kids do? They self-organise, they set their own social rules. But when they get to the workplace, they often find themselves cast backwards to a hierarchical system of command and control that emasculates my creativity. My own 22-year-old daughter recently finished an internship in, uh, in one of the com comms PR um, consultancies, and I thought, that's going to be a fabulous place. She hated it. It was full of deference. People asked her to make cups and tea and coffee. It was absolutely unbelievable. I couldn't, it was incredible. Um, so, just because it's a creative industry, don't think it's necessarily going to be a liberal environment. We have to recall that some people like the trappings of power. Think of Mr. Putin. Like deference and power itself. But happily, smart managers have the insight that they will shine twice as bright if they share power with the up-and-coming generation. That's you lot. So let's imagine that you are one of those smart leaders, which you will be, 
What would you be looking for in your people? What do engaged people look like? Here you go. They enjoy their work and whatever they do. They innovate and disrupt the status quo. They risk speaking upwards to challenge and innovate. They make it safe for people to challenge up. They self-organize with less need for costly supervision, like the kids. <coughs> Near me in Sussex, um, there is a factory that bags salads, huge factory. It operates 24-7. It has around about 28 nationalities, many drawn from the former Soviet-occupied territories. And they have two shifts, a day shift and a night shift. The night shift is easily the most productive, because there are no managers there. <laughs> so they're self-organizing. Um, which uh, is a bit of an irony. They take responsibility, they collaborate with and beyond their border. They resolve difficulties locally, like, like nature's way, and they're aware of personal risks and are generous with, with, uh, generous with time and skills. The last should be first, they are generous. Think about the leadership styles that you have experienced. The effective ones will be, uh, all have been generous with you. Generous with their time, generous with their care, and generous with, their, with your development. These key people are capable of innovation and disruption. Uh, Jeff Immelt of GE says, let's disrupt ourselves before others do it uh, to us. You have to be, be aware also that the life cycle of firms is getting shorter uh, because the disruptive technology is taking firms out much more, much more quickly. So you look at Forbes or any of those, uh, it's shrinking from 30, 40 years, 10, 15. Who knows? Will Microsoft be around in 10 years' time? Who knows? Amazon. And engaged people uh, are, in, are capable of extraordinary things. If you just think of juries comprising people like you and I solving complex, uh, complex issues, which are of value to the community. Similarly, engaging people at work in the complex, complex problems of the of, of strategy change and operational improvement brings benefits such as better solutions and faster, more sustainable delivery. But, but, in UK wide polls of people at work conducted for our firm by pollster YouGov, it was concluded that only 33% of people at work were operating as apostles, highly engaged. A further 20% were disconnected and 28% were hostages. And this picture, by the way, is repeated in North America, pretty much. So the apostles on the right, the hostages on the left, and the, the arrow going up is satisfaction with the workplace. And the arrow down the, the bottom is engagement. <coughs> so just think if you could move some of the disconnected and the, and the hostages and the fence sitters up into apostles, how much, uh, how much value would be added to that firm? Of course, you get a much better picture uh, of many, many more apostles if you focus down on startups. You'll have a complete reverse of this. You'll have very high levels of, of engagement until they start to uh, get bureaucratic. There's plenty of data to say that engagement works. Um, there was a government inquiry called Engage for Success, which is still ongoing, which I participate in, which uh, produced a ton of data, stuff like, I'm not going to go through all of this, Engaged employees at the top take half the number of sick days. Picking out Marks and Spencer's stores with improving engagement delivered £62 million pounds more sales. We can do with a bit of that at the moment, I think. BAE, engaged staff reduced playing construction time 25%. BAE, same staff found £26 million in savings in two sites, and so on and, and so forth. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence now that engagement uh, is a path to fight high performance. So, the case is set, the business case is partly there, but how do you do this stuff? What are the ingredients of effective engagement for individual leaders? People like you that you are today, and people like you that you will be uh, tomorrow. <coughs> we see two ingredients. On the left hand side, my decision making pattern and preferences, and on the right hand side, the minutiae of my presence when I interact, interact with others, colleagues, or those that work for me. Just before we have a quick look at these two ingredients, I want to uh, take a look at the, the elephant in the room. 
There we are. There's the <laughs> pink elephant in the room, I hope. The pink elephant metaphor. It means the unspoken issue, the thing that nobody wants to talk about uh, in, in a group of people. So I start by saying that the creating the conditions in which people choose to engage themselves requires leaders, managers and supervisors to consciously consider who else will add value and speed if involved in day-to-day -day decision making and big ticket change like strategy and so on. Unfortunately, our decision making patterns are often an unconscious, instinctive and subject to irrationality, learnt tacitly under command and control and all through living in authoritarian social country cultures. Uh, so engagement poses a massive paradox in, 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 dictat in dictatorships. How are you going to make engagement work in China? How are you going to make engagement work uh, in, in Russia uh, without it simply being a, a manipulation? I don't know the answer, but I, I think it's a, it, it lies at the, the boundary between uh, the coming battle between liberal democratic capitalism and authoritarian uh, capitalism that we see rising in China uh, and uh, other places. Although I have a bet that China will, will blow up within five. The elephant in the room, the pink elephant in the room, is the power paradox. Let me explain that, the power paradox. Leaders, managers and supervisors who intellectually may or may not know that engaging others will add value but they cannot break that pattern of making all or most decisions for themselves. They're addicted to it. Addiction. The bottles are deliberate. And they lack the hard facilitation skills and the confidence to govern more inclusively. Governing more inclusively is a very, very uh, important phrase uh, in all of this. So let us now take a look at um, the decision making bottle, so to speak. First of all, we have to be clear about what is, the, uh, what is a decision, what is decision making. It is a reaffirmation of intent. It is a change to previous intent. It's an invisible cognitive process when it's made by one person and it becomes a visible social process involving many, uh, when it does involve many. So now with the elephant now firmly out in the open, let's unpack that first ingredient of effective engagement our preferences and patterns of decision making. When we ask employees what experience they have of being engaged in decision making, they report five approaches in the firm or the institution. And you might want to think about your own emerging pattern of engaging others. So from the top left, you have Telling the many what has been decided by the few, with an outcome typically of hooliganism and spectatorship. Selling to the many what has been decided by the few, with an outcome perhaps of compliance collaboration. Inclusion, driving accountability down with an outcome of willing collaboration. And co-creation, judging who will add value if included in front-end decision making um, for strategy and change. Outcome personally committed or reformers. Broadly speaking, the top two tell, sell, characterise top down, the God complex. There is a fifth, which is this. There is a fifth way they decide, but don't even bother telling us. And funny enough, uh, you still hear that. So the key here is to understand your own personal decision making process. What might it look like? And I can pretty much guarantee that uh, probably very few of us have stopped to think about what is my decision making process and where did I get it from. So, there will be a pattern <coughs> and you could think about what does that look like from the shoes of somebody who works with me or for me. Uh, sorry, I've too, too far. So, uh, this is what a good pattern looks like. And here you have the first step, considering who else would add value if engaged up front. You've negotiated authentic agreement about a decision with a shared story. You've considered number three, who needs to be engaged in the, in the execution. Missing words there. Uh, fourth, you've decided how to engage people, what kind of interaction, and you've learned from listening. But you may ask, what is the benefit for me for engaging people <coughs> more openly in the decision-making process? And I think it is these 
Five things. Better decisions, faster execution through and with people, not to them. More headspace for you, because you're not having to kind of do so much. Less dependence on you. More trust for them, and we've seen what trust looks like, and the smile that it, it generates, and the energy it generates, and a happier team. You have to understand, if you like, the influences that have, that have, or in your case, many of your cases, are forming now your approaches to how you will involve people in decision making. All life is about negotiation. And that is so true of work. So there are three patterns, three influences rather, uh, that shape your decision making pattern, mine. Now the role models I have learned from, they're regional and cultural differences and their organizational cultures. So let's pick up with, uh, the, with the role models I have learned from. And that's what this picture is all about in just a moment. Across our childhoods, your childhoods and careers, which have started or are, are, are yet to come, we are influenced by heroes and rogues that we come to mimic tacitly. Some of these are noble role models and others are not. Some of the rogue role models result in you adopting patterns and behaviours which actually become outmoded and outdated and unuseful. The heroes and rogues exercise enables you to remind yourself which role models have shaped your current preferences and patterns. So here is mine, or some of mine, um, with business leaders, Jim Shiro, who <coughs> ran PwC in Zurich, uh, two Valerie's, both at British Airways, Valerie Gooding and Schooler, uh, Wally Odins, who created one of the biggest corporate identities, and so on and so forth. For various reasons, they were pretty influential, uh, I, I figured out when I first did this. What I did realize was that I had named a lot of very strong men in my early career. Very strong. And I figured out that my father uh, was absent from my life from the age of three. He was killed in the Royal Air Force flying. So when I went to work, I went to work looking for daddies, basically, um, for, for a while. And then I got out of that habit and went to look for girls. <laughs> Still doing that, but... <laughs> Politically incorrect in an academic institution. <laughs> uh, in effect, we are a compilation of the many influences that we have experienced, like mine. It may be the first time that you have travelled back in time to review your influences. Spend a couple of minutes thinking about, from childhood all the way through to now, people that you think, wow, they were generous to me. Wow, I, 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 I so much kind of mimic them and do what they did. Just take, take a couple of minutes. Normally, we take a lot more time, time on this, but just have a little thing. I bet it's the first time you've ever, you've ever thought about it. So the, f the first one is the role models. The second one is the, the, wh where I've come through. So we need to reflect on the country, regional, social influences that have influenced your style of leadership. So whether you come from these different countries, there will be social mores that influence you very strongly. Being aware of these will help you make considered judgments. Hey guys, listen up. Thank you. We need to be aware of uh, where we have come from um, and think about what is going to be what is going to be sensitive to diverse populations when we become a leader of others who are not from our queue. That's very important. So we need to think about what have we brought with us from where we came from. And the third influence uh, is, is the corporate, and this will apply less to you just now, but it will become important. This is a picture of, a, a, uh, of, of two different cultures. On the left, command and control, autocratic, hierarchical, secretive, monolithic, adult, child, fear culture, status conscience, deference, Permission culture, bullying, grandeur, clubby, elitist, private, formal, serious employee. And on the right, if you like, is the emerging characteristics of the mutual organisation. And we do an exercise with people where they sort of put put dots on where they think the organisation is for each of these each of these descriptors. And then you can have a, a conversation about the culture that we have now and whether it's fit for purpose and the culture that we need to move towards. Uh, in order for us to survive, thrive, and have fun. 
you know, so uh, the organization culture is hugely, hugely important. So I want to leave the decision making pattern behind and look at my presence in terms of how, which is the other side of how effectively I will engage, I will engage others. So it's the idea of personal presence by, by which we mean the way you habitually come across in face-to-face -face and virtual interactions with co colleagues. Few of us, myself included, have much insight about our personal presence, professional presence, and performance styles when we interact with, with others. So why is insight about our personal presence key to engaging people effectively? Because our presence will either be a barrier or an enabler of engaging others in the task to hand. A great manager, leader, supervisor will have insight about how their decision-making pattern is made visible and able to flex their performance styles in different situations that make people feel safe and encouraged to participate. So, what is this presence? What is the minutia of my personal presence, professional presence? It's my manner and manners and of course I'll import some of this from the society that I've come from. <coughs> is my tone. How dare you be late? Is my tone of voice. It is my generosity, or their generosity. It's mood and mood creep. And it is the performance styles which I'm going to explain in just a moment. And the thing about this is that uh, your legacy precedes you. And in an organisation when you reach a position of some power, People will already be guessing how you're going to react when you come into the, when you come into the room. Uh, you're being prejudged from the last performances that you gave, a bit like a, a bit like an actor. And that's either going to be great, or they'll all be going, "Oh God, she's in a bad mood again." So, if you like, uh, our presence, your presence, and performance styles are the way your decision-making process is made visible through the way you interact particularly at work with others, but also in a social setting. And most people we know, because we've rehears researched this, adopt three or four performance styles. And by performance styles, we mean the roles that we adopt when we interact with others. And we think uh, there are about 14. And on the three sheets, I'm not going to ask you to do anything on this, because we really do need more time uh, to do it. But if you look at the three sheets that follow, uh, I just want to point out the performance. How this is organized is that on the left hand side of your pieces of paper is the performance style. The expert, I am an, I am an expert and I'm a teacher, or I am an evangelist, or I'm one of the gang, I'm always down there with the guys and girls, you know, trying to be as cool as they are, which is hard for me, uh, or I'm a maverick, or I'm a confidant. And then across the page, uh, it is saying, How's that, how is that wrong? How is that expressed in language, in tone, in body language? And again, I'm not going to go through it because uh, we don't have time. So that's the, the first set. And then the second set, in your second page, is the arbiter. The T's flirt. It happens. There's no part of it it doesn't. It happens. The lobbyists are always pushing for their point of view. The lobbying can become bullying very easily of others, intimidation. <laughs> The sniper, they wait till the beating is just about to get to the end and then they go, ah, but this won't work because. <laughs> sniper. Um, <laughs> and then the last are the visionary, the team coach, the reporter, and the autocrat, and I'm sure there, there are many more. So, <clears throat> if each of you, in due course and probably already, are an amalgam of perhaps two, three, or four of these styles, the question is, do they help you get your work done by the way you interact with other people? So we use this as a way to get insight and a way to get people to reflect on their, their performance styles, where they've come from, why they've adopted them, what they think are useful about them, and what they might possibly adapt. Um, it's, not, it's not about telling them anything. This is all about insight, personal, in, intrinsically incited uh, change. So I've taken you through a romp from the sort of the grand scale of uh, the nation state, looking at employee engagement, then looking at the two ingredients for managers, leaders and supervisors, which is my decision making 
methodology and pattern. And it is a pattern, and it's usually a tacit and under misunderstood pattern. And then the way I present myself, present my decision making pattern. So let's conclude. Um, you can't spray engagement onto, you, you can't do this artificially, there has to be real insight. So people cannot superficially adopt the appearance of effective engagement. We must, they must delve into their patterns of decision making and work out where these patterns originated. Was it past role models or country cultures or both? Effective engagement requires a fundamental shift in personal attitudes to power and deference, particularly to power and the love of it. Those that learn to govern their decision making in more mutual ways will create a team ethos that everyone wants to be part of. This is not to say, by the way, that you end up with a commune. Effective engagement requires strong leadership, but not about everything, about fewer things. And under command and control, the dictator uh, will have to be right about everything. Whereas, uh, in a more mutual piece, he or she will lay the law down on just a few things, the direction, perhaps, what's not, what, what is not negotiable. So, effective engagement requires leaders, managers, and supervisors to be clear about what is not negotiable and why it is not, so they can explain it. And with this clear, leaders can make a clear invitation to others to challenge and contribute in safety. And the end note, um, the government inquiry, uh, this definite late boomer, Sir Wim Bischoff, until recently, I think, chair of Lloyd's Banking Group, and he's been very much part of the government inquiry into all this stuff, said, employee engagement will become one of the key health factors to be considered by shareholders, uh, etc. Et, et so now, a shareholder will say, show me your numbers. They're beginning to say, show me your employee engagement uh, numbers. So, uh, it, this stuff will matter in the big corporation where you will, where the new technologies, the digital will drive this to, to figure out who are the most engaging leaders and they will get on and the others will, will not. And of course, if you're doing a startup, uh, unless you're engaging, uh, you won't have, have the talent that wants to stay with you. So that's uh, as much as I intend to uh, say in a formal sense, try to give you a few exercises and a bit of a taste for the, the territory here.